among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Verse 45. Even, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Please be seated and pray with me now. Father, we just thank you for this wonderful day. Lord, we thank you for this time that has just passed, this Christmas time, this season of joy, this season of peace, this season of love, the season that reflects giving. And Father God, you gave us the greatest gift, your son Jesus, who is the reflection of your pure love in a humanly bodily form. But ever so being divine, being all God and all man, the perfect priest, the perfect king, the perfect prophet, the perfect servant. And Father God, we thank you for his example that you have given before us that we may follow in his footsteps, striving every day, repenting, but trying to be like him. Father God, we just thank you now for every gift that was open, every gift that was unopened, every gift that was thought about to give and wasn't given. Lord, we just thank you for the health, life, and strength and breath that you have allowed us to have to see another day. Because that in itself is a gift. And we know that every good and perfect gift comes from above. And the greatest gift of all was your son Jesus who came from above. So we thank you now, Lord, in advance for that person that whosoever that want to give their life to Christ today, we thank you for them. Lord, we also thank you for that brother, that sister, that Christian who's struggling with whatever struggles they have, with whatever's going on in their mind, whatever struggles they have with alcohol, drugs, whatever going on, depression, struggling with, with hate, struggling with anger, struggling with whatever it is, Lord, that they turn it over to you. Father God, we pray for that right now, that we put our hearts and minds and set them upon, set our focus upon Jesus, Lord. Your son, the greatest gift ever given. It is in his name that we pray. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. And the church said amen. Amen. I just like to take this moment real quick, not, not begrudging the time, but I just want to thank you on behalf of my family to you guys who were so generous last Sunday and blessed us. And I just want to thank you, my wife and my family. We all thank you for that. That was so wonderful and so sweet of you. And I truly, truly appreciate it. But not holding back for the word of God, I like to lift up verse 45. Verse 45 says, For even unto the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to give his life a ransom for many. Give his life a ransom for many. I like to speak from the thought this morning. How much is your life worth? How much is your life worth? Turn and smile at your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh my neighbor, how much do you think you cost? Just turn and tell them I'm priceless, baby. We're continuing and finishing up with the thought of servanthood. We started off with talking about Jesus being a perfect example of servanthood, washing feet. We also talked about Bible study, how Paul, how Timothy, and how Erapathias all were servants for the Lord. But Jesus being the perfect servant, Jesus being the greatest servant, Jesus the greatest example we ever had of servanthood, speaks now in the text. And it's fitting because as yesterday was Christmas, we must continue on the idea that servanthood is also a gift. Servanthood is the idea of giving something, is giving of yourself, which is the greatest gift. And in today's text, Jesus puts worldly attitudes, worldly goals, worldly perception and rules, and worldly points of view into a tailspin. Jesus flips the script on how things should be done here on earth as in comparison with how things are done in heaven. What set the discussion between Jesus and his disciples starts earlier in the chapter in verses 35 through 41. And I'll recap for you, giving you the backdrop. James and John 
Jesus, part of Jesus' innermost circle, approached Jesus with a proposition. They wanted to rule with Jesus, one sitting on the left and the other sitting on his right. They were jockeying for positions of authority and wanted to rule in verse 37. And in verse 38, Jesus tells them, you can't do what I'm about to do. But they retort, they respond and say to Jesus, oh yes we can. And Jesus says, and responds back to them, well then you will drink of the cup and suffer like me. And we will see this later on in Acts 12 when James is beheaded. And then John, later on in life, would be exiled to the island of Patmos. They would both suffer as saints for Christ's sakes. But it is John and James' desire to be lords or rulers, giving in to their earthly, fleshly desires right now. They wanted power. They wanted fortune and they wanted fame like the world has. It would be their pursuit and this discussion that will cause an uproar, jealousy, and tension between the other disciples. Where there had not been any strife so far, where there had not been any division, this idea, this proposal, the idea that John on my left and James on my right will cause division because they wanted power, fortune, and fame. Verse 41 goes on to say, when the other ten heard it, they began to be displeased with James and John. Translation, they were mad. Not only they were mad, but because they were upset that they saw them reaching and grabbing for power for themselves. Or what the disciples perceived as power or worldly authority. The question I have for you, brothers and sisters, this morning is this. What do you give up? What would you sell? How much is your soul worth for the things of this world? In other words, how much is your life worth? You see, Brother Gay, that's what we see here in the text. Look at verse 42. But Jesus called unto them and said, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and their great ones exercise authority upon them and this would like to give you three for the Trinity for the glory of God we see my first point your life has no value to tyrants because they enjoy ruling and exercising authority over you brothers and sisters your life has no value to tyrants they don't care about you they don't they don't worry about your life why because they enjoy ruling and exercising authority over you. Looking at the text. Jesus here in the text this morning. It was going to set his disciples straight. About what their true priorities are. When serving in the kingdoms of God. And now Jesus didn't want his disciples to become caught up in the world's version of what they consider greatness. You see, Brother Sean, he saw that they were craving worldly authority. He saw that they were wanting not heavenly righteousness, but worldly greatness. And brothers and sisters, that's a problem for everybody. You see, Miss Ashley, we have to teach everybody a lesson around us. Jesus tells us in verse 42 that the world tyrants rule cruelly without regard for how people they rule or how they feel. In other words, they crush their spirit, they destroy their hopes, they just rule for one thing, pleasure. Now, let me give a little definition for the word tyrant. It means any person in a position of authority who exercises power oppressively or despotically. And that's how Jesus was describing the leaders of the world. Look at the text, verse 42. Ye know that they which are counted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. Lorraine, that's tyranny. That's absolute rule. They enjoy taking pleasure in the powers and their positions. The famous comedian Mel Brooks coined the phrase, it's good to be the king, meaning all the pleasures, all the benefits, all the riches and fame for being a king is great. All the good stuff that comes with it from being a tyrant, which is having a good life. The pleasure comes from exercising that authority over men. You see, the perfect example of that comes from a conversation that Jesus had with Pontius Pilate. When Jesus was placed before Pontius Pilate, before he was executed, Pilate, the Roman governor, had the power as the Roman governor to execute Jesus. And that's why the Jews, the Pharisees, brought Jesus before him. 
It is in their conversation in the book of John, 19th 19, 19 chapter, we see how that is exercised. Pilate tells Jesus, I can do what I want, when I want, how I want, because I'm in charge and no one can stop me. But Jesus explains back to him, are you speaking? Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Pilate says, but Jesus answers him back. You have no power against me unless it has been given to you from above. Somebody say from above. The idea from above is that it comes from God. No man, no woman, no child, nobody has any power unless it's been given to them by God. You see, Jesus' response put things in proper perspective. It puts it in proper order. Only power anybody has comes from God. Miss Anita, far too many people enjoy having power and abusing it, not wanting to be held accountable for their power. You see, Jesus was making a point clear here to his disciples. The exercising of power, how you do it and how you use it, you must understand and respect and appreciate what power is. You see, Marty, let me give you an example. A loaded gun lying on a table is powerless. But when it is put into the hands of a person, it becomes a dangerous thing. Now, a person has the power of life and death in their hands. Now, if that person has not been taught how to respect or how to rule or wield that power they have in their hand, now that person can be very dangerous. You see, you have to be respect of a weapon. That fierce power that they have in their hands can destroy. You must be a responsible person with a weapon. It is in the wrong hands. That weapon can be used in horrific ways. Now, it's the same thing with power, brothers and sisters. Power hungry people, when they become corrupt because their power is unchecked, not monitored, or governed by a higher authority, that's how a person becomes a tyrant. You see, Miss Margie, making the age old phrase, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Just ask all the Caesars, just ask Saddam Hussein, Mao Zedong, Stalin, and Hitler. All those people are examples of people who are tyrants who have unchecked power. When there are no checks, when there are no balances, when there are no safeguards that protect people, rulers become tyrants seeking their own destructive desires. But let me tell you, Rachel, Jesus was warning his disciples in these verses by teaching them not to do the things by the world's standards, but by my standards. That's what Jesus was trying to say. Jesus was teaching how true power is to be used by a servant leader. A true leader is a servant first is his message, is Jesus saying. And then he serves others and he wanted to get that point across to his disciples. But Jesus realized that when he said this, it went over his disciples' heads. That's why in verses 43 and 44, he clears it up. Look at the text. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Which leads to my second point. Knowing your true value requires a great man to become the least of you, making him the chief of all of you. Knowing your true value requires a great man to become the least of you, making him the chief of all of you. Now, a great man or woman, let's put it in proper perspective, must know their self-worth. A Christian must remember who they are in Christ. Nancy, we are beloved children. We are joint heirs with Christ. We are brothers and sisters with Christ. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. That's what we are in Christ. But what Jesus wants every one of us to remember is that we are servants first. You see, Jesus establishes the requirement and the standard of a servant leader here. It requires humility. You can't stumble if you're humble. 
Let me tell you what happens first. Jesus says, he gives them a stern warning saying in verse 43, but so shall it not be among you. In other words, don't y'all be like the world. Second, Jesus gives them a requirement for being a leader. Looking at verses 43 and 44, being the big cheese, the head one in charge, look at what the word servant says. And depending on the version you have, the version you have may read the word minister. And it may be changed from minister to the word slave. And from slave to servant, depending on which one you're reading, what version you have. But what that means is this. is a person who serves in a position as a servant must be a slave or someone of the lowest degree. Meaning, you're not at the top, but at the bottom. You're in the position of a servant. So what that tells you is this. The least of you shall be the chief of you. Look at verse 43 again. Whosoever, that's anybody. When it says whosoever, that could be B. That could be Miss Minerva. That could be Sister Stewart. That could be me. Whosoever will be the chief of you shall be the servant of all of you. The least shall be the chief. Again, Jesus doesn't want his disciples to get caught up in how the world's viewpoint is about power and position. That's why he again warns them, so shall it not be. You see, thirdly, Jesus changes the paradigm. He shifts the priority. He changes the requirement. He establishes heavenly righteousness as a model for leadership. Not worldly greatness, but heavenly righteousness. You see, a servant leader must be committed and willing. Here's the hard part. Must be committed and willing to serve others. Here's the hard part. Must be committed and willing to serve others. And then do it. Hold on. That means you have to do it. You don't just talk about it. You can't be all talk, bumping gums and lips, but you have to do it. And again, it says in verse 43, whosoever of you will be the chief, this shall be to serve all of you. So let me tell you, if you want to run things, you got to be ready to love Jesus. You got to be ready to love your neighbor as yourself. I don't hear nobody shouting now, but put others' needs before your own. Serve as a servant, working hard in the service for the Lord, suffering here it comes criticism persecution being hated and rejected by others we all want to be hugged and loved but let me tell you the things you think the way you feel about our Lord Savior Jesus Christ the world's gonna hate you you're gonna suffer some criticism you're gonna be persecuted and hated by others Rejected even by your own family members. Jesus was. His own family members came one day looking for him and they rejected him as well. But rejoice. Here's the thing. Rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings so that his glory is revealed. That you may be glad. Not just glad, but with exceeding joy. And if you are reproached, if you are hated, if you are hated for the name of Christ, we are blessed for the spirit of God, the spirit of the Lord rests upon you. And God is glorified by your actions. Let me be clear about it. Doing these things, it doesn't get you celebrated. It doesn't get you the fame. It doesn't get you the fortune here on earth. But in heaven, hello somebody, but in heaven you are rewarded and revered as a good and faithful servant. You see, remember Christ's teaching about what he does. Everything Christ taught goes against everything that the world standards and measures by success. World measures success by money, fortune, and fame. You just heard the scripture. It's measured by being the lowest, by being the servant. I don't see none of these famous people trying to be servants. They all want to say, look at me, give money to me, look at me. Uh, but Jesus says, you must be a servant. Be the chief, be the chief, you must be a servant. The way the world does things and the way a Christian does things are diametrically different. How the world does things and how Jesus does things are totally opposite. Let me give you some example. God is holy. The world is evil. God is righteous. The world is wrongness. God is pure. The world is polluted. God is humble. The world is proud. God is generous. The world is selfish. God is love. The world is nothing but hate, y'all. Hello, somebody. 
You see, Jesus provided this example here in Mark about servanthood, but the went even further. Remember we talked about the other Sunday about how Jesus washed his disciples' feet saying, If I am your Lord, he says, and your teacher, and I have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. For I have given you the example of what you should do. As I have done, you should do also. But Jesus went even further saying, I want you to understand that a leader is not above the one he leads. Most assuredly I say unto you, a servant is no greater than his master, nor is he who sent him greater than he, the one who is sent is not greater than he who sent him. Now, let me sum that up. Jesus sets the example. He leads the way, letting every born again believer, that's me, that's you, that's everybody in these four walls, to understand that the standards of unrighteousness cannot get you greatness. But the way you get greatness is by holding on to God's standard of righteousness. In order to be a great person, you must be a servant. We are called to serve one another through love. To practice true servanthood, to be a true servant leader, you must serve others with no strings attached, no selfish motives, no hidden agendas, no ulterior directives. We are serving for the glory of God. You see, the church is a family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are called to serve one another. Let me put some Bible to that. Galatians 6.10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us all do good to all, especially to those who are in the household of faith. That's you, B. That's you, Teresa. That's you, Ms. Lorraine. That's everybody here in this house right now. We are a part of the household of faith. Now, anybody here ready to serve their brother and sister in Christ? Anybody ready here to give God the God that we serve, the God that we love, the God that gave birth, was given birth yesterday that we celebrate his birthday? Come on, got some glory right now. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise. Give him the fruit of your lips. We're bringing this train into the station. My first point for review. Your life has no value to tyrants because they enjoy ruling and exercising their authority. My second point, knowing your true value requires a great man to become the least of you, making him the chief of you. You got to go low, y'all. But lastly, my third and final point, the true price for your life required the son of man to serve and become a sacrifice for many. The son of man to serve and become a sacrifice for many. Look at the text, verse 45. Even the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That's the example. Jesus lets us know right here in the text the perfect example for even the Son of Man, that was Jesus, came not to be ministered, meaning somebody serving him, but to serve. Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, meaning the Gospel of Mark, if you're not familiar with it, portrays Jesus as a servant throughout, being a descendant of Abraham and David coming down 42 generations. And Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, signifies that he is the one prophesied by Daniel, which had dual meaning, meaning I am all God and man, but I am the prophesied Messiah. Jesus places himself as the ultimate service servant. He says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. Somebody just shot it on that. He's ready to work. He's ready to do all the work. He has done all the work on Friday, that good Friday, that afternoon. When he went to the cross, that's his finished work. Which points to the last part of verse 45. Look at the text. To give his life a ransom for many. That's Jesus' mission statement right there. I'm here to save the world. A ransom is the money that's paid for a hostage. A, a money is also, the ransom is also the money that's paid for a slave. We are all hostages. We are all slaves to sin. John 8, 34 says, Most assuredly, Jesus said, I say unto you, whosoever commits 
says sin is a slave to sin. But Jesus comes and has to say this about the text. I have come to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, Jesus was here at the right time. Just while we were still powerless. Just while we were still weak. Just while we were too weak to do anything. Christ died for the ungodly. That's me. That's you. That's everyone. No one would be willing to die for another person, Rachel. No one would be. But for a good person, maybe someone might think about possibly dying. But God demonstrated his love. But God demonstrated his love. But God, but God, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's a ransom. That's a, that's a price. That's a heavy cost. That was the precious blood of a lamb sacrificed because we didn't deserve it. But it served as a ransom for our sins. Let me be clear about the life application point here. Jesus came to earth to be our savior. He was born in a manger and suffered and was delivered into danger. Don't let another member moment, that minute of a minute go by letting him be a stranger to you. Serve him. Commit your life to him. He gave his life for you. Are you willing to serve him like he served you? Are you willing to commit your life to Christ in service for Christ? You see, Martin, you know what I like most about Christmas? Is watching the faces of my family as they open their gifts. I got to see my wife cry tears of joy yesterday. It was so nice to see her cry tears of joy. I really, I really enjoyed it. We all, we all were like totally like floored by my wife, and I loved it. I loved it. But B, the Bible says that God gave us a perfect gift in that He spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for all of us. How shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Somebody say all things. What a great gift freely given to us all things God demonstrated his greatest love his only love the purest form of love by giving of his son Jesus as a ransom to pay for our sins but it gets better Margie eyes have not seen ears have not heard all the things that God has in store for us believers every good and perfect gift comes from above so God never gets tired of blessing his children we woke up this morning hello somebody you woke up able to see hello somebody you you have health and strength. Hello, somebody. But the gift is not like the trespass. How much more is God's grace that by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, how have how has it overflowed to many? So I gotta ask this question, to everybody here. How much is your life worth, Lorraine? How much is your life worth, Miss Yvonne? How much is your life worth, Miss Teresa, Miss Ashley? Miss Ivy, how much is your life worth? Because here's the thing. The ultimate cost, the precious blood of Jesus, was priceless. But a gift, Colossians 1 and 20 says, his gift came to reconcile all things, having made peace through the blood of the cross. In him we have redemption. In him who was knew no sin became sin for us that we may know the righteousness. But the greatest gift, the greatest gift, the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God. Somebody say gift of God. But the gift of God is eternal life in our Lord Christ Jesus. So I ask you this question before we go home today. And finish unwrapping gifts. Finish playing with those little Tonka trucks. Finish playing with whatever toys we have. How much is your life worth? It was so much so precious that God was willing to give his son to pay for it on the cross. With that being said, I pray everybody had a Merry Christmas. Rise to your feet.